Good morning. Buenos dias, everybody. Uh, if you have not been to St. PJ's or Sidon Home, you should go one day and visit the place. I was talking to someone the other day, and I refer to St. PJ's as the Hilton of the shelters. <laughs> so it's a beautiful facility, and they do so much for, for these kids. Uh, so yeah, my name is Antonio Fernandez. I work at Catholic Charities here in San Antonio. I have been blessed because I work at different Catholic Charities through the United States. And, uh, what we do in San Antonio is a reflection of what the Catholic Church does through Catholic Charities and entities like St. PJ's and Sidon Home. One of the biggest stigmas that I have to defend every day about Catholic Charities is that we serve everybody, regardless of are you from the United States, are you undocumented, are you documented, are you Catholic, are you Muslim? And that says a lot about who we are because we are universal. Catholic Charities here in San Antonio is the only entity in San Antonio that is authorized by the government to bring refugees to the city. So we have a contract to bring between 800 to 1,000 refugees every year. Mostly, they are this year, they are from Ghana. They are from Congo, Nepal, even Cuba. We provide them with services, employment services. We teach them English. We do as much as we can so they can be self-sufficient within six months, which is a lot to say expecting and thinking that some of these people never spoke English before they got here. And I mean that about the religion thing because, you know, I'm not going to talk to you about the statistics because you have great speakers before and they give you a lot of numbers and history. But I'm going to tell you, like, my first experience here in San Antonio, which was at Lackland Base. Almost two months ago, I think a little more than that, I went to Lackland Base to meet the kids um, Archbishop Gustavo went and sent me to the kids, and I was blessed and honored to be with him there. It was a great experience, but, you know, it was sad. It was sad to see kids walking in straight lines with their hands in their backs, not even able to teach each other, to touch each other, I'm sorry. And they had me asked, we had me asked uh, three times because we have 200 kids there. Uh, we couldn't give them communion. I'm sorry, we couldn't do the handshake for the peace because they couldn't touch each other. Uh, so we actually started doing mass on a weekly basis. And after the first time, they actually allowed them to, to touch each other, just to hands, you know, the hands to do the, the peace sign. But it was a great experience that day. Um, what I'm talking about the Catholic Church serving everybody, that day I was asked by the president of um, Baptist Children Family Services, I actually offered him, like, what can we do for you? What Catholic charities can do for these kids? And I was told nothing. The government is paying for everything. So at the end, actually, they said, you know what? We need Bibles and New Testaments in, in Spanish for these kids. So we start collecting them. And I was accused on several occasions of trying to convert kids to the Catholic Church, which was not my intent whatsoever. <laughs> um, but Lackland Base was, was a great experience. We, since then, have tried to do many, many things within San Antonio to help these kids. One, the first or the, the biggest one, has been uh, we organized a donation drive for them. Since when we have collected over 100,000 pieces of clothing, we collected up almost $90,000, tons, thousands of little toiletries, shoes, toys, New Testaments, Bibles. All of that has been given to different entities. St. Pages has received Bibles and New Testaments. They, everything else, more or less, is paid by the government. The same thing with Sido Home, which is a very similar uh, location as St. PJ's, but mostly focused to teenage mothers and their children and babies. We also help Lackland Base when it was open. We have helped Rio Grande, and you saw the numbers about Rio Grande and Laredo. Rio Grande and Laredo was a different type of shelter. Catholic Charities, on those two locations, partnered with the archdiocese and created small shelters, temporary shelters, so when it, whenever the border patrol agents were picking up the, the kids in the border and instead of taking to the Yeleras, they were taking them to Catholic Charities. And it was a great experience. They got thousands, not thousands, hundreds of volunteers from Catholic Charities through the United States to go and volunteer for two weeks or more. People like from San Antonio were dropping close to Catholic Charities here. We had a pickup truck and then a u haul truck just to give them the donations because the, it became amazing. 
So the donations that people in San Antonio were giving us, we actually were added to the donations that people from Chicago were giving to us and North Carolina. And it just became a larger issue than just San Antonio. Since then, the minors have decreased. You saw the numbers. Laredo still is accepting clothes from Catholic charities, so we're still like, giving them as much as they need. Rio Grande has asked us to stop. They don't need any more. Lackland is closed. But last week, on Thursday, I had the opportunity to see the new detention center for families, for mothers and children at Carnan City. It's very, very sad. I, you hear the numbers. I'm going to give you two small stories from these people. But a quick number is the facility is 100% full. They have 532 people, 228 mothers, and the rest are children. The sad thing is that it's a profit business. It's not like some PJs or CRAs or Raices. We're not here to make money. We're here to help people. This new facility is a profit business, and I think everybody should understand that. And you know, the same way when you go to some PJs, and I really mean that it's a beautiful location, you know, you go to this place, it's a jail. They used to have adults in that location. So you go to the jail, they open the door for you. Before you open the next door, they lock the, other, they, they lock the door before. You have to go through metal detectors, and so on, so on. <coughs> and what they have right now is mothers and children. And I wonder, how much risk are these mothers and these children to the United States? I don't think too much, but maybe some people may differ. Very sad thing about that location. Um, you know, James spoke about every single child goes through therapy at some PS within 24 hours. There's 532 people in this detention center. And call it a detention center, call it a jail, whatever you want to call it. To me, it's just a jail painted in yellow. You know, there's only one therapist for 532 people. And I ask how many therapies you have, just one. I'm just trying to be, you know, difficult, I'm sorry, but it's like, oh, is that enough? Yes, it is. We don't have any problems. You know, the stories that you heard today are true. I have drama in my house every day, and it's a one-th a one of a thousand of what these people go through, one of a million. And how many of us need therapy because something tiny? So let me just give you two different examples. I met a woman. She left Guatemala because her husband had been killed by the gangs. They cut his body in different parts and sent, her, sent the body to her. She was able to get the man who killed the husband and put him in jail. Nine months later, he was out. Nine months. When he got out, he was able to kidnap her son and told her, unless you pay me X amount of money, I will kill him and send the body parts to you, and then I will kill you. So this woman was able to get the money, get the son, and get to the United States. There's two common, uh, I spoke Thursday, I, I think I spent the whole day, maybe like nine, 10 hours at three centers, St. Peter's, Sidon Home, and Carn City. And I think all of the stories, bad one, was because people were afraid for their lives. There was only one person who I spoke that she came because she wanted to have a better life. But the people at this place, they are scared to death. The fact that they only have one therapist says a lot about that facility, in my mind. You have your own opinions. Something that we spoke before about the beast, the train, every single woman that I spoke to, at, all, at the two facilities that I spent a, a lot of time talking to women, they said that all of them took the buses. Some of them spoke, we took a train once, but now it's, all everything happens in bus, which I was very surprised. In Carn City, um, I saw two things where uh, um, interesting to me. One was that uh, everybody has a phone, can, they have the right to make a phone call for three minutes to their countries. And if you cannot make it, then too bad. They will not allow them to do that. I don't know if that's legal or not, but that's what they, they were telling me. And I think the saddest thing for me, besides all the horrible stories that I heard, was um, how every person at the site had to have an ID. But at the back of the ID, have a, cor um, a barcode. You know, and to what point we start treating people like human beings and we start treating people like objects or numbers. You know, it says a lot, I think. Otherwise, the facility, I have to be honest with you, was they had everything that 
we had to. They have a cafeteria, they have the rooms, they have a small school, they have the clinic, they have a place to you know, cut their hair. But it's a jail. I mean, who wants to spend time in the jail? So our visits to the sites have been very touchy, and very powerful, and we have been able to use the stories to talk to other people. And Catholic Church has been trying to get contracts from different places in, within the United States to actually save more people. Um, we tried to apply, and we actually did apply, to get a home, a shelter. I wanted to have a home for, for these people. And it was one of these, I think um, Jonathan spoke before about, you know, you were able to get, like, host a family of mother and a child for free. I mean, you will have to pay for everything. The government would not pay you a single penny. So I was able to actually get a convent, donate to Catholic charities. I was able to get donors to give Catholic charities hundreds of thousands of dollars to open a small home in the east side of the city for mother and children. When I called back Washington, D.C., because they had requested that early June, when I called back, and this was late July, because it took a while to find money and location and so on, they told me the government doesn't, doesn't want to do this anymore. They think the best thing for mother and children are to be in the detention centers, not out there in homes because they're afraid they're, afraid they're going to flee. But they told me, well, if you ever want to, you know, if you still want to do it, we can put you on a waiting list, and you actually will be the first facility in San Antonio, in Texas, to have just one hosting families for mothers and children. And I said, great. You know, we'll do it. That's my duty. That's my obligation. But they told me, well, we forgot to tell you. If you do this, you're going to have to put an ankle bracelet in every single mother mm -hmm. and every single child. So, I mean, I'm talking to, to people in Washington, D.C., and I just wasn't sure if it's my accent, my English, or what was that? <laughs> but, I, you know, I said, like, are you telling me that I need to put a bracelet in a baby or in a toddler? And they said, yes, every single person living in the house will have to have a bracelet. So it was hard for me to, you know, to say yes. I said, fine, we'll, we'll talk about this, but put us in the list, and we'll see what happens after that, you know. Um, and I've been trying to talk to people. I met with a congressman, and, you know, assured me that if we get the shelter, he would do his best to actually, you know, ensure that we don't have to have the bracelet. Because when I do research about the bracelet, the bracelet has to be charging less than one meter, so like two feet from the wall. So how can you have someone for like two hours just like this? I, it doesn't make any sense to me. But that's what we were told. So with that, we have different grants we apply, um, and many, many people, and I just, I, the positive thing about this has been cooperation with people. I mean, RISIS is working with Caritas Legal Services that we have in Catholic Charities, who are working with St. Mary's University, and Tom Mengler and I becoming really good friends just because of this. Then we're helping St. Peter's, we're helping Sidon Home. There's so many entities just working together to get these kids' lives better, and the mothers, and everybody. Um, but also, you know, people outside San Antonio. Uh, I was able to meet with Josefina Vázquez Mota, who ran for president of Mexico years ago. She's really committed to help kids now. She's not running for politics mm -hmm. anymore, so maybe that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And she wants to help the dreamers, and she wants to help and accompany minors. You know, I was lucky enough that 10 days ago I met with Carlos Slim, the wealthiest man in the world. Well, buddy, you got the money. So it was. Well, he actually has given a Catholic entity that we are part of $650,000 grant to actually provide services to dreamers. Now that's focused in Arizona as in California, but we are working to bring the money back to San Antonio as well. Because this is not just the Cubans. This is not just the, the people from Guatemala and Salvador and so on. It's everybody. But with Catholic charities, we have had thousands of calls of people asking us, How, what can we do to help? You know, so besides everything I mentioned to you, we also were asking for volunteers. The problem that we have when we go to, we went to Children Baptist Family Services, they say, Antonio, we don't need more volunteers because the government pays for everything. When I went to Carn City, they're telling me we don't need volunteers because the government pays for everything. We were able to get a program for people over 55 years of age. Um, and they actually are funding us just to pay people who want to volunteer, you know, um, insurance, food, and mileage. Then through Caritas Legal Services, we are helping raises to actually go out there to the facilities and actually help them with that as well. But I think the most important thing that we are doing is called, we got a contract called Safe Passages. And it's just whenever these kids are released to foster care, 
when they are in those wonderful homes with their people, will be able to actually do the follow-up services with them and ensure they go to the doctor and ensure they go, they go to, the, to the lawyer and have to make uh, the appointments. But it takes a village to do this. So this is not just Catholic charities or races or St. Mary's or St. Peter's. It's all of us doing this together. It's very, very sad. But we're going to keep trying helping them. And we know, well, actually, I don't even know how many people are coming or not. Because I hear 60,000 next year, 90,000 next year, 98,000, 96,000. Every week, the whole thing changes. It's like the Pope, expect the unexpected. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. But I mean, one thing I think I, I can tell you is like many of us are prepared for next year. And we're going to get prepared. And we're going to get even stronger. So thank you so much for everything you guys do.